Welcome to Intro Psychology Unit 12. In this unit, we're discussing social psychology. And social psychology really makes up this interesting gap in the psychology field. It falls between other fields like sociology, but also includes lots of elements of cognitive psychology. To get things started, it's important to acknowledge that with social psychology, we're interested in demographics a lot more than we are in other areas of psychology. And speaking of demographics, over the last four years here at the University of Calgary, it's important to understand that roughly 75% of our intro psychology students have been female, with the remainder almost exclusively male, but with about 1% of our students identifying as non-binary. We've also identified that just around 40% of our intro psychology students identify as white or of European heritage, with other groups such as South Asian or East Asian making up significant portions of the pie, followed by students who identify as Hispanic and students who identify as Black. And in terms of ages, although the majority of students are between the ages of 18 and 20, we also have to acknowledge that those students over the age of 25 are actually about 10% of our student population. Now, these demographics might be switching this year because we're learning online, and we might see that change. So we pay attention to the demographics, but we also pay a lot of attention to what is going on cognitively. And sometimes there's a lot of overlap between cognitive psych and social psych and really make up the area of social cognitive psychology. What are these cognitions we talk about? Well, one, for instance, is talking about attitudes. And so an attitude is really your judgment about a person, an object, an experience, about anything. And so you might be judging someone's conditions or your conditions or the outcomes of behaviors or the behaviors themselves. An attitude is sort of if you consider something to be positive or negative, if you like it, if you dislike it, what is your opinion on it? There's not necessarily a right or wrong when it comes to attitudes. This is very different than achievement-based tests that have a right or wrong response. We tend to see what your preferences are. Now, when we think about attitudes, it's important to acknowledge that we measure both explicit and implicit attitudes. This is how conscious we are of our attitudes or if we're aware of these attitudes at all. Now, the type of attitude that we are aware of is our explicit attitudes. These are the attitudes that if you believe in gender equality, if you have a preference for your country of origin, if you have an attitude about human rights, then that's going to be an explicit attitude. So these are things that you can articulate or that you know at some level. You'll be able to rate on a Likert scale or on an opinion survey. But we also have attitudes that may be shaping our thinking that we're not consciously aware of. And these are considered to be implicit attitudes. Now these happen in an unconscious way. You're sometimes not even aware it's going on, but it does tend to impact you on a physiological level and does tend to impact you in terms of your cognitive biases, particularly with how fast you can answer questions on that topic or how fast you can answer questions that mismatch your biases. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. This work on implicit biases is very controversial with lots of big speakers in psychology attacking this type of research because sometimes there's some criticisms about the validity of the measures, but other psychologists believe in it and really say there is something to this implicit measurement. For one example of how we can test the differences between explicit and implicit attitudes, you might ask someone on a survey if they think that have making a sex tape or recording one's sexual interactions would be considered moral and ethical. And what we might find is in a cohort of young adults, they may say, yeah, that's fine. If hypothetically someone wants to make a sex tape, I encourage them to do that. That's as long as they're two consenting adults and they negotiate the data privacy and all that, it's fine. However, if you were to ask the same young adults what they would think about their friend if they heard their friend made a sex tape, we find that they become very judgmental in their facial tone, in their physiology, their blood pressure tends to raise. And if they're filling out a form about what would happen and what the responses would be hearing that a friend made a sex tape, we find that they actually show a lot of physiological symptoms of disgust and contempt and that they start to have a lot of judgment in their thinking. Even though explicitly they say it's fine, it's different when it is their friend. And so what we might find is that although we say one thing, there's something going on behind the scenes where our brain is still not okay with the thing we say we're okay with. We'll talk more about this as we go on. But just for now, remember that our attitudes can be both explicit and implicit. And our implicit attitudes we're often not aware of at all. 
Now, aside from attitudes, we also are very interested in attributions. And one researcher that really helped to get the narrative and the vocabulary about attributions rolling was John Rotter. And so what it goes on in attributions, this isn't whether you think something is positive or negative, but it's whether you think the blame or the credit is owed to you or owed to something else. And all of us will do all of these things at various times, but it's important to understand there is one mechanism known as internalizing. And internalizing is when you really take the outcome and you credit yourself or you blame yourself. So regardless of whether it was good or whether it was bad, you attribute that to being owed to your personality, to your disposition, to how much effort you put in, or to your talent. So if you don't do well on a test, it's the idea that you didn't study well enough. Or if you did do well, you studied enough. And if you did well in a video game, well, it's because you worked really hard at the video game or you're very skilled at the video game. People who tend to use internal attributions more tend to fit into some personality traits. They tend to be a little bit more ambitious. They want to control things. They tend to be more likely to be activists because it's the idea they have to get out there for a cause and they have to do something because the onus is on them to change the world. People with a really internal attribution might also be more likely to use the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps sort of phenomena. And so it's the idea that it's your hard work and your effort will get you places in life. So we all use internalizing from time to time, but some of us use it more frequently than others. The opposite of internalizing is externalizing. And externalizing is when you owe the outcome of something to conditions beyond your control. This is the idea when you say, it's not really about me or what I do. I'm really shaped by the economy. I'm shaped by the government. I'm shaped by historical privilege. I am shaped by the rules of bureaucracy and red tape and what will be will be. Now we all externalize from time to time. By individuals who externalize more are more likely to say that when they do well on something, it was due to luck or due to the fact the test was easy. Or they're more likely to believe that when they do bad on something, it's because the teacher had it out for them or the teacher was difficult or the test was exceptionally hard. And so because of this, people who externalize more often are less likely to put a lot of power in their own effort. Therefore, they tend to be less likely to try hard. They believe everything's going to be up to fate or destiny as so they may be a bit more lazy. They also might be more likely to use substances because they're less likely to really see how using substances can lead to outcomes because they're less likely to make the connections between themselves and those outcomes. Now, certainly all of us internalize and externalize at different times and even within one day, we might do various types. But some of us put a specific filter on whether we internalize or externalize. And sometimes we use a filter called the self-serving bias. The self-serving bias is the idea that we specifically internalize our successes and give ourselves credit for them, but externalize our failures and blame others. So this would be the teammate who, regardless if they actually get the winning goal or not, when their team wins, they believe they are the MVP. And when the team loses, they believe it can't be their fault, it's everyone else's fault. And they exclusively think all the wins are on them and all the losses are on other people. This leads to a lot of interesting personality traits. Individuals who use the self-serving bias more often tend to be a lot higher in narcissism. They have a hard time even acknowledging criticism. These are the students that when they get an essay draft back, their brain filters out all the constructive criticism and filters out all the errors they got wrong. They only pay attention mentally to the check marks. And they say, well, if I got all this right, why is my grade so low? This professor must have did something wrong with their grading and they have a hard time even reading and acknowledging and processing the constructive criticism. What happens here is when an individual with self serving bias is in a relationship or even if they're working with colleagues, they constantly think that every problem at work or every problem in the relationship is not their fault. It's the other person. And if the other person tries to meet them halfway and say, look, I'm sorry for this and they expect them to apologize, they won't apologize. They'll say, yeah, you should be sorry. So there's a bit of this one-sidedness where they always feel they're on top. Now, although they always feel they're on top, are they? We actually find individuals with a very strong self-serving bias tend to be more likely to fail. And that's because they don't acknowledge their mistakes. They can't learn from the mistakes. Now, the opposite of the self-serving bias is the self-defeating bias. This is another filter we can put on, but it's just the opposite. Instead of externalizing our failures, we internalize our failures and we blame ourselves whenever something goes wrong and we externalize our successes and give credit to other people.
So this is an individual who whenever something goes right, whenever someone flatters them, they say, oh, they didn't mean that. They just felt like they had to say that. Or if they get a good grade, oh, that, that was just a fluke. Or that test was easy. It's not due to me actually being smart. They consider all their successes and all their wins were not them. It wasn't their hard work. It wasn't their personality. It wasn't their intelligence. It was something else like luck or, some, or conditions. And then when something goes wrong, it can never be someone else having a bad day. It can never be just the system worked against them or just the way things go. They believe, oh, I didn't get that job that 200 people applied for. I must be the terrible person. Or they made one mistake on the test and they say, oh my gosh, I'm such a failure. I made that one mistake. What we find is really high achieving people tend to use a self-defeating bias. They filter out all their wins. They filter out all their compliments and they only pay attention to the negative things. This would be like if you get a test back and you totally forget that you got 98% on the test and you tunnel vision right on the 2% you didn't get and hyperventilate and really destroy yourself mentally and emotionally over it. Or it's the idea that, yeah, they got dumped a few times in the past, but now they're in a loving relationship. They minimize that loving relationship and they focus on their insecurities. This type of focusing can be somewhat adaptive, much like anticipation and defense mechanisms, but it often comes with a lot of consequences. People who use self-defeating bias tend to have a lot more anxiety and much lower self-esteem where they never feel fulfilled and they never feel like they're enough.